At some point far in the future, historians will probably ask, what was daily life like in the early 21st century? Well, one thing we know for sure, nobody will ever point to these two clowns and say, this was how you should have been stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and you know, when I was a new investor, I wish I'd realized earlier that splitting your returns, one for me, one for you with your broker, well, that's just not a great idea. So hey, what lessons do you wish you'd known? Here to help you get your investments together for the new year, we welcome from the Financial Residency Podcast, Ryan Inman. Plus, from Afford Anything, it's Paula Pant. And from this podcast, we welcome a guy named OG. But that's not all. In today's Friday FinTech segment, how do you find better investment help when you're first starting out? Here to help from Titan, it's Clayton Gardner. Of course, we'll still answer a Magnify money call for help and save time for my incredible trivia. And now, the guy who's been investing since the New York Stock Exchange members in New Holland met under a tree, it's Joe Saul Sihai. All the old guy jokes are out today already. Hey, everybody, welcome back to Friday. Helping you usher it in. I am Joe Saul Sihai, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And I am the old guy here today because, unfortunately, Len Penzo is not with us. But we have good news. We have upgraded to a much, much better guest who we will tell you about in a second. But first, let's introduce the man across the card table from me. It's my good friend, OG. How are you, man? I'm very good, actually. Thank you for asking. Yes. Ready to help young, new, and not even young, just young, old Young at heart investors stack more Benjamins today. It's hard for me to concentrate when just over your shoulder is a big bag of peanut. There ice. is a big bag of peanut. We, and that's all I can see staring at me. Come over here. I put that right over my shoulder so that you keep paying attention. Oh, okay. Because you will you will look very close to me if uh, if we do that. Uh, somebody who I'm looking at through my dad's shortwave because we've got the new upgraded version of a shortwave. In Las Vegas, it's my friend Paula Pant. How are you, Paula? I'm doing great. It's almost the holiday season, so I'm excited to to get on with the rest of the year. Now, do you put peanut M&Ms right on top of the shortwave radio so that you continue to focus? I can't say that I do that, but no. maybe Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. I, I will neither confirm nor deny that one. Frozen <laughs> Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Frozen. Mm. I got to tell you, it's a little like catnip for OG. Just saying. <laughs> yes. And the guy who's uh, catnip for this podcast, that's that's not, nope, no. Nope. No. Nope. Try again. Didn't do it. Do over. The guy who's going to save this podcast, that's a good one. Joining us from also, where the heck are you now, Mr. Inman from Financial Residency Podcast? Where are you at? San Diego. The place where it's like 75 and sunny every stinking day. Yeah, it's a rough life over here. I I feel so bad for you. For the three people who don't know who you are, and by the way, for people who might not know who Ryan is, I got to tell you, when we announced that Ryan was coming on the podcast again this Friday, there was like this rush of people telling me how awesome it was that you were coming back. And I felt bad because it's been a little while, dude. Oh, man, I got to tell my mom thanks for writing in. <laughs> Apparently she wrote 26 in. 26 times. Yeah, 26 wrote, times. 26 times. That's yes. Awesome. Much, I, I knew it wasn't either listener who would write in that often. But tell everybody about the podcast because we love the Financial Residency Podcast. Yeah, I've been lucky to have you on twice. And uh, Paula's show will actually be coming out in the end of January, which will be super fun. So if you enjoy hearing Paula, you can come over and check that one out in January. But uh, it's a podcast, you know, really helping physicians understand their finances and just digging deep and and helping them understand, you know, what they're doing. And, you know, they went through all these years of medical school and training and never really understood anything about finance. So going five feet down a mile long, the way I look at it. And I would even broaden it, even if you're not a physician, if you're somebody with high income, you're a high income earner, or you're somebody that's accumulated a ton of student loan debt because you were hoping to be a high income earner, or yeah. you're somebody with a high net worth, like you cover all those things. 
Yeah, I mean, they they obviously overlap quite a bit. It's primarily for physicians, but we have plenty of non-physician listeners that write in and call in all the time with questions as well. Well, we thought you're the perfect guy to help us because, as you know, Paul, if Len were here and Ryan wasn't here, all of his recommendations for new investors would be uh, buy more gold. Exactly. Buy more gold and build a bunker. Right. So because we already knew that, I'm so glad we got Ryan here. We got Ryan, we got Paula, we got OG. So let's get this party started. We're going to have a theme the next couple of weeks. This week and next week, instead of having an article that we talk about and having it dramatically read, like we have the past few episodes by a member of uh, the financial community. By the way, thanks to everybody who's helped us do that. Instead, I've asked all of you knowledgeable investment peeps to give new investors a leg up. I remember when I first started investing, I spoke with a broker. I had a ton of debt and I had no emergency fund. And those were the first two questions he asked me. He said, so have you built up, how much money do you make? And I think I said $28,000. And then his second question was, do you have an emergency fund? And I said, I, what, what's an emergency fund? And then he said, do you have any debt? And I had credit card debt and student loans. And I was still in college. And he said, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take care of those student loans. Like for a commission-based broker, he gave me some fantastic advice. But I didn't know the difference between a uh, mutual fund and an exchange-traded fund. I didn't know an IRA from a mutual fund. I didn't know what anything was. But if somebody were to hear three pieces of good advice from each of you, what would those pieces be? So we've got two CFPs and Paula Pant. So I'm... (laughs) I'm going to start with who uh, I would think a lot of people are surprised is not a CFP because she talks like a CFP. Uh, Paula, what's your first piece of advice for new investors? I would tell a new investor to learn the difference between a vessel versus what that vessel contains. Because oftentimes I will hear new investors say, oh, I don't want to put money in my 401k because I'm afraid of the stock market. But there's a distinction between a vessel versus the underlying asset. So a 401k, an IRA, an HSA, a taxable brokerage account, these are all vessels. They're like containers that you can hold your assets in. And then stocks, bonds, commodities, those are different types of assets inside of it. So think of one as the coffee mug and the other as the coffee. You can have a coffee mug and if you don't want to drink coffee, you can fill that coffee mug with tea or wine or vodka, whatever you prefer. So the first thing I would tell people to do is learn the distinction. Why, when they say wine or vodka, do Ryan and OG both their heads start going, yes. We both both perked up. Like, what what was that? I would put that in it. That is the equity of of coffee cups. I like wine and vodka. (laughs) So essentially what I'm saying is pour vodka in your coffee mug. Ta-da! And that's how Paula starts every morning. Right there. (laughs) Uh, But you see that all the time, OG. I saw that when I was a financial planner where somebody says, I got a Roth IRA at the bank. And when you tell them their Roth IRA doesn't have to be at the bank, Mm -hmm. that it can be wherever you want it, it brings up what Paul is talking about. I had this discussion with my dad when I was brand new. I'm like, you got to do this 401k thing. He's like, I'm not giving those sons any of my money. I'm like, no, it's not your, no, it's not give, no, stop. You know, you don't even know where to start. Right. It's just your money. It's just in a different place. I'm not giving any of those sons of guns any of my money. He just equated his workplace retirement plan with the union keeping his money. Yeah. You know, it's just a hard thing to break. So this is a good one. I like that one. That always drives me crazy, Ryan, when somebody goes, I don't like where I work, so I'm not investing in the 401k. Doesn't hurt your work at all. It hurts you. Yeah. I actually have had clients, several, think that their 403b was a scam. And so during the residency where they could have been putting money in, they opted not to. Not only did it inflate maybe their uh, income-based repayments, uh, income-driven repayments for their student debt, but they're not saving anything because they thought it was a scam. They didn't take the little bit of research and time to kind of go through and make sure that it's not a scam. Paula talking about the vessel, the cup, right? By the way, Paula, Mm -hmm. I used to always talk about a present, but the present says you can't open it till a certain day. Like, you know, for people to celebrate Christmas, Grandma mm-hmm. brings over the presents early, but you can't open it until Christmas Day, you know? And if it's a traditional IRA, 
It's not December 25th. It's 59 and a half. Ryan, do you have an analogy like the coffee cup, which I love, or the present that you use to explain the difference between the wrapping on the present and the actual present itself? Uh, I'm still at the vodka and the coffee cup. (laughs) (laughs) So, no, I actually actually really like the vessel idea. Yeah, that's a fantastic idea. What would your first piece of advice, though, Mr. Emmon, be for a brand new investor? So I, I don't know about you guys, but I get a lot of people that write in or call in and they say like they've listened to every show, sometimes even twice. And they go through and they're doing all these things. And then they ask, well, how do I get started? I look at it and I'm like, you know, you probably shouldn't have listened to hundreds of hours of me talking about something and just got into action. So don't over consume content unless it's stacking Benjamins, of course, Uh, but don't over consume content and realize that it's not going to be perfect, but just get started. Understand a little bit about what you're doing, but just take action get in in motion. The hardest thing to do is get in motion. So just get in motion and get going. I t- Paula, I saw you nodding your head there. Yeah. And I see the same thing happen in business with people who want to start side hustles or become an entrepreneur. They spend so much time learning about things that they, but they never actually do anything. But oh, gee, we're afraid to make a mistake. Isn't that the problem? This reminds me of a uh, concept that I learned in Strategic Coach which is all about 80%. So just be good with 80%. Get 80% of the information you need to make your initial decision, like Ryan said, and just start the activity, whatever it may be. Tony Robbins would tell you to never leave the site of a goal without taking some action on it. And it's very powerful to have some motion, which kind of creates that tidal wave or that snowball or the emotion or whatever uh, you need to use for an analogy for the next step. And it might be something as simple as like, I need to start my 401k. The only thing I need to do right now is go online and get a login. Like that's the only first step. That's a good enough step. You're not committing to putting $19,000 into it every single year from now on. Just get a login for the freaking account first. That's funny. I've actually heard that from many different coaches that don't try to finish the big task, just try to start it. And once you're in action, you just continue to roll downhill. Yeah. 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 Good stuff. That brings us to you, Mr. OG. Two solid ones. And I'm going to let everybody down. Mine is all about like dovetailing a little bit off of Ryan said about doing something. I think it's really important to do it frequently, whatever it is. If you're going to start saving or if you're going to start investing or if you're going to start paying down debt, in this case, we're talking about investing start doing it very frequently. Maybe once a week, set up a $10 for every Friday is going into your investment account or $50 or $100 or whatever the number is. You know, you can do your retirement plan contribution per paycheck. So you've got your, you know, your 401k contribution is per paycheck. It's some sort of frequency that it's something that you can get used to very, very, very quickly. And the more frequently you do it, the more that that kind of habit, if you will, gets ingrained in your new world. You know, if you're going from nothing to starting to invest, you know, that's a whole different world. So you have to think like an investor and an investor is investing. They're doing something. They're not passively sitting around. So not only take action, but take action frequently. There's another benefit, Ryan, to what OG is saying, which is this idea of dollar cost averaging. Can you explain that? Because if you're investing frequently little bits of money, it's it, it's going to help you avoid some of the rough and tumble of the market. Yeah, you're not trying to time the market. You're, you know, let's just use a, a $100 a month, right? You're, you're putting $100 in every month. You're not worried about, should I put this whole amount in right now and buy it at this price? It's actually staged over a certain period of time. So just as you're doing it frequently, you know, hopefully it's not lots of vodka in the coffee cup frequently, but, <laughs> you know, as you're doing it frequently and, you know, the habits take a long time to, to you know, to actions take a long time to make a habit. So uh, I like that, you know, keeping frequent you know, dollar cost averaging is, is a great way to invest as you're doing it over time. Small bits, you know, don't try to eat the elephant, just eat it one bite at a time. Paula OG talked about habits and I know you like me, you're a big fan of James Clear and mm-hmm. uh, talking about atomic habits. I think you also had him on the afford anything podcast, mm-hmm. building habits as a new investor OG says, invest often, invest early and often. Are there any other habits that you can think of that that new investors need to learn? 
Well, it isn't so much of a habit as it is. It's almost actually the antithesis of a habit. It's set up as many automations as possible. Because if you automate something, then you only have to do it once, which means that you don't have to turn it into a repeated behavior. So for example, making an automatic contribution into an account is, you know, you set up that automatic contribution once and then it just autopilots. That's fantastic. Let's stick with you for a second. What's your second piece of advice for new investors? I would go through a couple of thought exercises to try to figure out your risk tolerance. So imagine that your portfolio drops by 30%. And don't think of it as 30%. Think of how much money you have in there. You Like imagine how much money you could realistically have invested by the end of next year. Let's say it's $10,000, right? Now imagine that all of a sudden the stock market tanks and your 10000 drops down to 7000 And like really sit down and visualize that and imagine how you would feel. Would you feel excited about the fact that everything's cheaper and now you can go on a buying spree and pick up a bunch of stocks on sale? Would you feel neutral? Would you feel scared? Would you feel like resentful and mad about the fact that you busted your butt for those $3,000 and now it's gone. If you sit with that and try to figure out what your risk tolerance is, you'll be able to then invest in a way that is in line with that risk tolerance. What if I told you, Paula, that I thought that risk tolerance was overrated? Ooh, I would challenge you to elaborate. <laughs> I accept your challenge. <laughs> here's, here's what bothers me is that, uh, especially for new investors, the first place they'll see risk tolerance usually is through their works 401k quiz, you know, uh, what's mm -hmm. your risk tolerance? And I always get frustrated by that because the 401k manual doesn't say what's the goal that you need to achieve and what return do you need to get to get that? Because for me, risk tolerance is irrelevant until I know what return I need. The real key to risk tolerance for me is can I handle the risk level that comes inherent with the return that I need. So if I know that I need 8%, then I look at the investments that do that, which by the way, guys, if you're new, which is who this particular episode's for, it's not as hard to get this stuff as you think it is. Looking, looking at 8%, what investments have done that, then seeing if you can accept that level of risk or not, and then asking yourself the question, can I teach myself to accept that level of risk, I think is far more important than a bullshit quiz. I like that. I like that answer. I do have an issue with the quizzes, but for a different reason. A hypothetical question around how you might feel if the market does X or Y or Z is if you've never been in that situation before, yeah. like your prediction of your own future behavior is unlikely to be very valid. And if you're a new beginner, uh, that's redundant. <laughs> if you're a beginner, if you're an old beginner, if you're a beginner, that's the best that you can really do because you don't have any experience to draw from. Unfortunately, trying to project yourself into the future is the best that you can do as a beginner, but predicting your own future behavior is inherently a pretty weak system. So that's actually the objection that I have to it, even though it's the best option available to beginners. But I think that one of the benefits of going through what you talked about, Paula, is, is your conditioning yourself for the response that you want to have when or if that thing happens. So Just by asking yourself that question, what if it dropped and you lost $6,000 or whatever the number? Yeah, I mean, yeah. to kind of expand on it a little bit, you're talking about creating for yourself your investment policy statement. So you're saying, I had 10000 now I have seven. Let me build out what I would do if that happens. And so one of the benefits of doing that is while you can't predict your future behavior, your mind will have already played that game once. So, mm -hmm. so you can, you can almost already know the outcome, you know, so it happens, you go, Oh, I know what I'm supposed to do. I decided three years ago when I went through this exercise that I was going to double my contributions for the next year to take advantage. You know, you can already put yourself in that frame of mind and you're right. You may not feel the way that you want to feel. <laughs> you may feel really ticked off and you thought you'd feel happy and excited but at least from a behavior standpoint, you might be in a position to do the right action anyway, because even though you can't anticipate your feeling, you can have a plan for what your action is going to be. Mm, so then it becomes a plan rather than a prediction. Yeah. Ryan, 
to bring you into this discussion, this time last year, as you know, the market was in a horrible place. And, and a lot of people were thinking that that was the beginning of the end. Clearly, we didn't have it this year. But in your practice, did you have people calling you just when this rumbling was going on, going, what are we going to do? Should I jump off a building? What, what, how did you handle that? Yeah, we had one out of like literally 100 clients go, hey, should we buy more because it's lowering? Oh, up? nice job. One. Ooh, yes, it is working. It is working. I'm so excited. <laughs> Joe, we know this, like you can go back all the way from 2009 to now and every year major publications have said, this is the year, this is the end. The sky is going to fall. Everything's going to come crumbling down. We're going to see this huge 2008 bear market, you know, maybe even worse. The headlines keep, keep saying it. And of course they don't know when it's happening or what's going to happen, but to jump in really quick off, off the investment policy statement and the risk tolerance. Yeah. I mean, prediction of behavior is somewhat flawed and OG and I, like we have to put together risk tolerance for clients, but investment policy statements are like the risk tolerance is one piece of that investment policy statement. So thinking through and actually sitting down and going, hmm, if this did happen, what, what do I do? That's the extra step that people should take, not just thinking hypothetically, oh, if I lost money, what would happen? And uh, Paul is totally correct is... Don't think of it in terms of percentages. Think actual dollars. Yeah, yeah. And what would right. you do in, in that? And try to get some emotion behind that because that's going to be the hardest thing to predict and you won't feel happy when you lose money. No one really does, but logically it, it should win out that, okay, hey, now it's on sale. Let's go keep putting more money in and, or just dollar cost average the whole way and not really worry about it. Not to stick with this too long, but Paul, I want to ask you about this because you brought up risk. When you get a call from somebody who's in their 20s and they're worried about risk on their retirement funds, do you think young investors worry about risk with a exchange traded fund or a mutual fund more than they need to? I think some of them do. I think some people worry about risk, not based on the fact that it's an ETF or a mutual fund, but rather based on the fact that it has exposure to the stock market or the equities market. I think people worry about that because there is still a collective memory of 2008 and that scared a lot of people. Yeah, and I think a lot of a lot of millennials started investing at that time, right? I exactly. mean Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The millennials were either just out of college or in college when the great recession hit. Yeah. So it was essentially our earliest formative adult memory. Ryan, what's your number 2? Yeah, so I looked at it and I was, I was trying to think, I don't want to sound like, uh, you know, maybe everyone else out there with three examples. This one I came up with was just prioritizing your investments correctly. So now that you've gotten started, you know, don't go off and invest in maybe syndications or something that you don't even really understand or giving friends and family money to start up their, you know, for their startups before you're actually taking care of your, you know, your 401k or 403b and your IRA you know, make sure that your prioritization of, of your investments, that cash flow is going to the correct places first before getting cute and fancy and trying to have outsized returns by doing different things that other investors might be saying that they're doing. So at what point do you give your clients permission to get cute and fancy, to use your terms? Yeah, I, it's, it's true though. I mean, well, if they're turning around and they're saving, so physicians are a little bit different because they think that they need a, a little bit higher savings rate than others because they're starting a decade plus later. Um, so maybe the percentages won't work for everyone. But if they're saving like 25% of their take-home pay already and they're maxing out their IRAs and their 401ks, then you can start to, hey, we need to put maybe some money in a taxable account. But also if you want to invest in real estate, let's go do that as well. Or, you know, at least look at that or, hey, you parents are starting, you know, have a startup or your brother or something, um, you know, not a huge portion of your, of your net worth, but that's when I think you can get cute and fancy as you call, it, as I call it. As, as you call it. Yeah. I'm gonna go, you call it. <laughs> I called it cause you called it cause I called it right. Paula, you're, you are a notorious index investor. You got any mm -hmm. cute and fancy in your portfolio? I do. I have a Robin hood account in which I buy individual stocks. Dun, dun, dun. It's a tiny... Is that now public? Oh my gosh, the horrors. <laughs> the shame. Shame. Gotta shame. wear the cone of shame. <laughs> yeah. 
But yeah, I've got about $10,000 in there. And that 10000 is my like crazy fun dumpster fire money where if I want to roll the dice on some individual stock, I'll do it. But only to knowing that I can find the maximum amount to ten grand. That's just my fun money. It's my casino money. I call it mine. I'm, I'm getting rich tomorrow money. I was going to say, <laughs> I call my casino money, casino money. And then, and then my <laughs> get rich quick stock money. That's a different bucket. That's a altogether. whole different bucket. Right. <laughs> Those are two different buckets. You know, we're joking about it, but at the same time, like it's a very small percentage of our net worths. Yeah. So like mm-hmm. while we all have something, I call it the lottery fund. It's a very small percentage. It's not like, you know, OG's over there rolling the casino money with like half his net worth. You have no idea. (laughs) (laughs) I'm trying to help him out, man. I appreciate it, but one of us is going to turn into be a liar. (laughs) He's got the over under on today's show at 57 minutes. So who knows? Yeah. I don't have that. The bookie's got the that. The bookie's got that. I got the under. You've got the, yeah. Gotta speed it up. He's like, we got to get out of here. Plus, he keeps and looking at done. those. Yeah, he keeps, <laughs> he, and uh, one and a half of these is enough. Uh, OG, speaking of that, what's yeah. your second tip? So, my other one is all about doing that behavior we talked about frequently. Let's add to it every six months. You know, the sneaky thing about money is that. Uh, no matter what level of money you have, you always wish that you had the next level of money because at the next level will be finally when I can insert thing here. We all have the stories of back when I was blank, I made blank. And then as soon as I wanted to make blank, then I would be rich. And then I made that. All of us have have had those uh, experiences. And we also can recognize and look back that it didn't turn out the way that we thought. I remember making $10,000 my first year thought if I made 40, I would be beyond rich. I made 30. I was pretty close to rich and I still didn't have enough money to save that, that year. And then if I could only make 60, then I would definitely be set up because that's $2,500 a month extra that I could just spend on whatever I wanted or save. Turns out I spent it on whatever I wanted. So there's all these different levels. You have to make money a priority of constraint also. So you start out you're putting 5% in your 401k or 3%, whatever the number is, six months from now, add another 1% to it. And magically what will happen over the course of just a few short years is all of a sudden you'll be saving 10, 20% like Ryan was talking about because your life just will expand into that little constraint that you had and it won't, it won't be a big deal. 1% is no big deal. Ryan, you talked about people doing this at work, like investing through their workplace plan. So it's pretty easy to go in and add 1%. But Paula, you're self-employed. So do you do what OG's talking about? Just notch it up another little bit uh, every so often. How do you give yourself those raises to your plan? Mm, I encourage people to do that. The way that I do it for myself personally is that I will bucket or compartmentalize like influxes of money for particular goals. So if I have a particular influx of money that comes into my business, I might think, all right, the money that I can pull out of that is my entire HSA contribution for this year. And then in one fell swoop, boom, I knock that out. And then if another bigger influx comes in, I go, all right, this is my backdoor Roth IRA contribution for this year. And then boom, in one fell swoop, check. That's knocked off the list. So I'll compartmentalize inputs of money based on buckets of investments that I can dedicate those towards. So you set up these, I've got to do this, I got to do this, I got to do this. And then you go fill those buckets. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, like, even even though you have long term goals, like you have a goal on how to get your goal. Yeah, I suppose so. Like, you know, my goal at the beginning of every year, I have this blank slate of all right, the new calendar year has begun. So now I've got to max out the four hundred one k. I've got to max out the backdoor Roth IRA. I've got to max out the HSA. And at the beginning of the year those three things are looming on my mind. And then once I can put check marks on all of those, you know, then I can think about the next goal. All right, what do I want to do next? Do I want to pay off a mortgage? Do I want to buy another rental? Do I want to fill in the blank X, Y, Z? We got just a few minutes left. So I want to quickly go through our next three. Paula, what's your third tip for new investors? Um, I would say don't try to, and Ryan alluded to this a little bit earlier, don't try to partner with a friend or family member or loan money to a friend or family member for their fancy business venture. In the world of investing, there's a lot of the blind leading the blind. 
and every other person has some kind of a great business idea that they just need a loan for or they just need a partner for. Stay away from all of that. Yeah, uh, Ryan, you had the spotlight partly there before, so so I'm going to go go to you. We obviously love our relatives, though. We want to help them out. And my cousin Jimmy's always been fantastic with food, so I should back his restaurant. Restaurants are a horrible idea. Why would you do that? Oh. Um, you know, I, I look at this as if it is truly important for you to help your brother or your cousin Jimmy or whatever it is, make sure all your other stuff's done first. If you're giving out a loan, just know that that money's not coming back. Like, let's be real. But these aren't investments, really. This is really speculation. Investments are the index funds and, and making sure that your 401ks, your IRAs, those things are, are fully funded. Um, these are, this is more speculation. I, I love that. Uh, what you said earlier, though, to put a cap back on that, that's not a loan. That's a gift. Very much. Yeah. What's your number two or number three? rather? Uh, learn to count. <laughs> uh, no, my, my number three would be, um, you know, if you're going through and you're, you're mapping out goals and you don't have to be as cool as Paula where your goals have goals. But, you know, if you're going through and you've, you've got your goals going and you realize that, oh, shoot, I can't fund this maybe investment goal. I'll give you an example. would be, I want to put money away for my kids for college, but I, I just don't have enough money in order to do that. If you find that and you go through and you've budgeted and done everything, then maybe realize that you could cut back in a certain area, not necessarily that you have to get rid of it completely, but that maybe something else isn't as much of a priority as maybe investing for your kids. So being able to look at your cash flow and to make that judgment call. We had a client that decided that instead of spending $800 a month going out to eat and, and on food and entertainment, that they'd spend 500 and that each kid would get $150 for their college funds. And I thought that was a really cool way of thinking about it. They didn't go cold turkey, but they went and said, hey, look, we're going to cut back a little bit in order to, to do that. So if you're getting through and you're starting to put money you know, in the right places and starting to get things done, but realize you don't have as much as you'd like, you know, being able to go back through your cash flow and be able to save a few bucks somewhere that you can allocate to something that'll make you happier. The thing that Ryan's alluding to, I love here, OG, which is also the prioritization game. Like I remember back when I was a financial planner saying, okay, w which one's more important for you, making sure that Judy and Jimmy go to college or that you retire at 55? Like if you can't get both, which one is more important? And this idea of maybe cutting back on X to get Y, I don't think a lot of people played it. Every time I played it, it was like something new to my client. Like they'd never done that before. It's like the priority or anti-priority, right? You just have to recognize that you're, in most cases, your finances are a limited resource for that period of time. And if you decide to spend it on going out to eat, that's okay too. Like just, but be okay with, that's the result that you get, you know, or... Or the priority is, I want to make sure my kids go to school. I don't care if I retire at 55. I can yeah. retire at 60 instead. Don't be mad at 57 when all your buddies are retiring early and you still got three years to go. Yeah, That you, was the choice that you made. You made the decision. Even by not making a priority decision, you're still making a sure, decision. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what's your third tip? Yeah, real easy. Kind of the same as Ryan's two and Paula's three, which is don't get cute. You know, a lot of times people get seduced by the cool, sexy thing. And, you know, you look at this list of things that you have to do, or you listen to a podcast or you read a blog article or a book, and it's all about these cool ways to invest and be financially independent. Quite often, the top of the pyramid stuff is really supposed to be just for that little bit. It's supposed to be just for a little bit of your portfolio. But that's where all the cool stuff happens. That's where it's like, I got Google IPO and I'm a gazillionaire, you know, or whatever. And everybody wants that cool story, but be boring. And the better you are with being boring, the better you're going to be financially. Yeah. Don't read that Market Watch piece a couple of weeks ago about the dude who bet everything on Ethereum and won. Look, look, did you see, see that? One. Oh, it was horrible. The, the, the guy asked his spouse if it was okay if he took all of their money and put it in, in crypto. And she said yes. And he went from, uh, I think, $100,000 to... 10 or 15 million dollars but did he get out he did get he got out at the right moment like he just went 15 exactly. million i'm gone yes and the bad news is 
is that he says, even in the piece that he is a gambler mentality. And I got, I got the feeling that it wasn't the last time he's going to gamble. Like, don't do that. I, yeah. I even hate the fact that piece was written yeah. because somebody's going to read that and go, Oh, and the guy in the piece even says, don't be like me. Uh-huh crazy. I got two things. I, I only have one because I love your nine. So we're going to make this an even 10. My best advice that I didn't hear from you guys is don't try to learn it all. I feel like, especially at the beginning, I love the action that you guys talk about. Just get started. I think that that's important and then do it often. I love, I love that advice. I also love thinking about your risk. I mean, I love all the stuff you guys said, but I feel like new investors are mostly paralyzed because they think they have to know everything about everything. If you begin with your goal and then look at what might fit that goal, start asking people who might know what types of things would fit that goal and only learn about that, you're going to be much better off. It takes this huge wide field and narrows it if you know where you're trying to go. So starting with your goal. I got to ask you guys this. I've got three of the smartest people I know in this area, either on my shortwave or sitting across the table from me. If I was to believe the bullshit internet pieces out there fees would have been on this list understand the fees would have been on that we gave people some brilliant advice how come fees didn't come up Ooh, that's some sherlock holmes stuff joe you just noticed what wasn't there <laughs> <laughs> like Notice that the dog didn't bark and that told you who the killer is. Well, as you know, Paula, OG and I, if we rant about this all the time, we say, yes, fees are a dragon, but they're not the number one dragon. Everybody focuses on this crap and it's not the number one thing to know. You guys are super smart. Why did it not come up? I was under pressure to come up with three. (laughs) And so I was really, it would have been number four if I would have had four. No, I don't know. But yeah. it's not a thing. But we're not saying it's not important. Pa- Paula, do you think that understand fees might be number 11, but I don't think it belongs on this list ahead of any of these? Yeah, honestly, it didn't occur to me. As I, as I thought through what a new investor would need to know, just wasn't one of the top things that came to mind. I freaking love that. I love it. Ryan, I love it. Yeah, I was thinking, you know, why didn't I bring it up? And I thought, maybe the bias of new investor. So the money wasn't a lot. I wasn't thinking that it was hundreds of thousands of dollars. Although I have clients that literally have that in the bank going like, I don't know where to start. So maybe I shouldn't have thought that, but you know, the fees are important, but it's not the most important. It be behaviors are the most important. I mean, think of all the, the top 10 there. A lot of it's behavioral. I'm super excited to talk to this gentleman. You know, frankly, when I first heard about Titan, I saw built like a hedge fund and thought, hmm, as you may or may not know, there are definitely downsides to hedge funds, but there's also some very attractive sides to a hedge fund. So like everything we do on Friday around Friday FinTech, I wanted to see how it worked. And also, while I was exploring to see how it worked, I also noticed that this gentleman, co-founder Clayton Gardner, who is talking to mom right now upstairs, he also makes some phenomenal videos teaching you how to be a better investor. So not only are you investing, but you're learning how to do more. Here to talk about becoming educated, what it means to be set up like a hedge fund, and how they invest money. Let's say hello to Clayton Gardner from Titan. And here he comes, here to tell us all about Titan. It's our new friend, Clayton Gardner. How are you, man? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Well, I'm I'm fantastic. You and I have both heard something for a long time which is that active investing is dead, right? And so I'm thinking, though, you might not agree with that if you're forming a company that, that really it has kind of an active bias. Would you say that's true? Active investing probably isn't dead? That's our belief. We're extremely positive on active investing, on active management done the right way. And I can talk about what that means, uh, but you're, you're, you're right. It's a very contrarian view nowadays, but I think that makes things interesting. I think you're right on also. And we normally don't do this in the Friday FinTech segment, but let's go there. Why, what does doing it the right way mean? 
first just defining terms. And I'm sure many of your listeners know these already. Um, active investing, we like to think of it as the investor taking the reins. So they're the ones making the decisions. What stocks or bonds or securities do they want to buy? When do they buy more? When do they sell, et cetera? So it's very much a do-it-yourself paradigm in active investing. Passive, on the other hand, is very much like it sounds passive. It's very hands-off. It's a set it and forget it approach. And over the last 10 years, with the advent of robo-advisors, passive investing has really taken the market by storm. And particularly the millennial generation that grew up on smartphones, it's a very software-driven type of strategy that they're generally following with passive investing in robo-advisors. And that's very easy. And so for many folks, that's the right solution. Our view is that for a big swath of the population, that want to actively uh, participate in the stock market. They want more for their money than the average returns they may get with a robo-advisor, but they don't fall all the way onto the other camp of doing everything themselves. We think there's a big void to be met for an actively managed robo-advisor. And so that's what we built with Titan. We're the first ever actively managed robo-advisor. And I can talk about what that means on the investment strategy front, as well as how we engage and educate users along the way. Yeah, I want to do that in just a second. But first, I'd like to talk about you co-founding th this company, Clayton. But let's talk about the origin story, though, of Titan first. Like, how did you guys decide to do this? Did you think that there was that void that you talk about and you could fill it? Or was it a frustration you had of your own? How did Titan begin? It ended up being a handful of the fact, the reasons you just described, but the idea of it was really, I can, let's rewind the clock. Uh, I guess it was almost 15 years now where I bought my first stock. Right. So I was allowed to buy my parents. I, I guess that's the way I would phrase it. Allowed to buy my first stock when I was about 12 years old. Um, this was early 2000s. It was just chore money that my parents let me invest in a brokerage account they created for me. And I did that for three or five years throughout high school. I started my school's investment club and I was just fascinated with the markets. And it didn't hurt that over those five years, I was making money hand over fist. And I thought I was a genius. And so I said, hey, I, I could really make a career out of this. I'm fascinated by companies. I'm fascinated by business. I'm entrepreneurial. And so I decided to go to Wharton Business School at, at the University of Pennsylvania. And that was fall 2008. I get to the first day of class. I meet my co-founder, Joe, who ended up co-founding Titan with me. And the world blew up. This was fall 2008. Yeah. Lehman Brothers went under. Stocks crashed. All the genius I thought had translated to this all-star portfolio had, had fallen by the wayside. So I lost pretty much everything. And I promised myself. And by the way, I, I sold most of the stocks that I ended up buying over those years. Oh. And I promised myself, and I can talk about why that was the case. And it, it hints at a recent episode you did on, on understanding your investments. It was the fact that I had no idea what I owned. And so I listened to the media and I listened to the talking heads. I promised myself at that point that I would go learn the ropes professionally. I would go learn how some of the best money managers did it. More importantly, I would understand how to analyze and invest in companies more deeper than just listening to the media. Um, and I promised myself I wouldn't make those same mistakes again. I knew I would lose money here and there, but I didn't want to know, I didn't want to be in absence of, of the reasons why I would lose money. You know, fast forward five years, I worked in hedge funds, I worked in private equity, and I reconnected with my co-founder, Joe, who I stayed in touch with, and he had taken a different path, not on the investing career front, but he went into banking and consulting. Joe and I started talking one day, and we realized that the way I was investing money, having done this now 10 years professionally, investing in all sorts of things that, that retail investors don't have access to, was completely different than the way Joe was investing. I mean, funny enough, Joe was not even investing. He had most of his money sitting in a checking account, earning next to zero. So we got talking, we started doing research and realized that there's just this massive divide between what the pros do with their money and the experience they get by being in the top 1% and what the other 99% of us have access to. We, we knew that there was a solution that could be built. So we put our heads together. A few years later, we ended up building what it is today, Titan. And just as an aside, Joe's not a guy that doesn't know anything about investing or good money management. My understanding is he spent time with McKinsey and at Goldman Sachs. This is a guy that knows stuff. <laughs> That's exactly right. And I would characterize Joe as one of the smartest people I've ever met and certainly not unequipped to start investing. I think for him, it was just a paralysis of choice. You know, he graduated school. No, no one teaches you how to invest in high school, let alone college or even business school. You know, they teach the academic principles, but no one really tells you, okay, your stock falls 50%. What do you do? Do you buy more? Do you sell? How do you make that decision? So it was no wonder that someone, yeah, as, as esteemed and pedigreed as Joe, as smart as Joe, couldn't make those decisions himself. And so I thought to myself, man, if we can't do it, having had the opportunities we've had professionally, 
I can't imagine what the rest of America is going through. And so that was a fire under us to want to pursue a solution to this. I would imagine, Clayton, being in the uh, hedge fund industry and in private equity, you saw both the best and the worst of that, I would imagine. Absolutely. You know, I, I joined the first private equity firm I worked at out of college was in 2012. And, you know, it was, I guess, almost eight years ago now. Over the last eight years, if you pull up a stock chart of any you know U.S. major stock market index, it's up and to the right. Sure. And I think it's now the longest bull market on record. And in spite of all that, most hedge funds have underperformed. I think the about the class, well. I think about to your point, not to cut you off, but I think about the Warren Buffett bet a couple of years ago, right? That's right. Warren Buffett made a bet with a hedge fund, a funds manager, yes. it's a fancy way of saying, you know what, Warren Buffett, I'm going to bet on a handful of hedge funds that as a group, this all-star team that I pick can outperform the basic Vanguard index fund that Buffett chose. And it, it's now a very popular bet. It's an infamous bet, um, one that, that Buffett won. I think that they, it was a million dollars or something like that. And they staked it for charity. So it was for a good cause. Right, but, right. You know, it shined a lot of light on what is now being picked up in the media as a very cliche thing to say, which is active management is dead. Advisors charge high fees with high minimums for subpar performance. And I think on average, that has been the case for the asset class. The bet that we decided to take here at Titan is that if you can identify the highest conviction investments of those top managers, you don't need to say bet on Joe Smith or Sally Jones. You don't need to pick one particular hedge fund. But if you just say, okay, on average, hedge fund managers are pretty smart people. They're generally fairly good at identifying high quality companies, the companies that are going to be around 10, 20, 30 years from now. And on average, that should probably grow faster than the average U.S. company. If you believe that, then there could be something here where we can maybe give investors access to the best performance of those managers without having to bet on a specific jockey, if that makes sense. And so that was really the genesis of Titan. It was, yes, active management on average has winners, it has losers, but the experience that you get investing with a manager has never been offered to folks. And our clients have been thrilled with, with how it's been going so far. Yeah, let's dive into how it works because this is this is the really interesting part. So people download the app on their phone or you can go to the site is my understanding. And just walk me through it, Clayton. How does Titan work? And what do I see if I download the app? It's really easy. So you download the mobile app in the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. It takes only a couple minutes. You enter in some basic information and you, you can start investing with those little $500. The way it works is we don't lock up your money. So you can get money in and out of Titan within just a few business days. When you invest as little as $500, that money gets automatically invested into a 20 stock portfolio. And those stocks are, are the highest conviction holdings of some of the leading hedge funds. And these are not, these are not fast money traders, so to speak. These are not folks that are looking to make a quick buck. These are the folks I described earlier, the folks that are, that have esteemed, you know, five, 10 plus year track records that are betting on the next Google, the next Amazon. So very high quality companies are in the, the portfolio you own. And then we explain everything to you along the way. So, you know, you invest $500, it gets automatically invested for you. It gets automatically rebalanced each quarter to make sure you're, you know, you're roughly equally invested in each company. Let's say you start with a thousand bucks. You own 50 bucks of Amazon. You own 50 bucks of Facebook, you know, stocks that are hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. So number one, you get access to fractional shares in, in some high quality companies. And the best part, in my view, is that we explain everything driving those companies every day. So if you open the app tomorrow, Joe, you'll see, you know, maybe Amazon is up 10 percent or Facebook is, is down 5 percent. And most folks go, they, you know, they hop over to the Google search engine or they turn on CNBC and, and they're scrambling for answers. The best part about Titan is we, we give that to you direct in the app. So we'll send you videos, we'll send you bite sized audio notes and insights and it's really a, an immersive experience to allow people to feel like they're investing in an actual world-class hedge fund. Yeah, you have, I'm, I'm fascinated by the videos, by the audio, by the learning that people uh, get as they invest, which I love because that's more about knowing what you actually own. You guys did a video a little while ago about a momentum shift that I have that I'm about to play, but can you set this up for us? Because you, you said at the time that this came out that there had been some market. You're going to begin this by talking about how the market's been going crazy lately. What was the time frame? When did this take place? So it happened in, I think it was mid-September. There's things that drive stocks called factors. Every stock has a combination of factors, and we like to think of them as nutrients that kind of go into foods. Yeah, so actually, also, actually, yeah. actually, I'm going to play it. I'm going to actually play it if you don't mind, Clayton. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, because you make this great analogy. So this is in mid-September. This is Clayton talking about some of the volatility we've seen in the market. 
Stocks have been crashing hard the last few weeks, and we've seen the sharpest momentum reversal in almost a decade. So I want to explain what exactly momentum is and why we here at Titan, we're not, we're, we're actually resting easy. We're not running for the exits like a lot of investors are. So momentum is what we call a factor. It's a quantitative variable that drives stocks in the short term. There's many different factors, and I like to think of them as nutrients. So momentum is a factor. You have value. You have size, which is large cap versus mid or small cap. Different factors are like different nutrients that go into different foods. So just like a food is composed of carbohydrates, protein, fat, each of which have their own benefits and their own downsides, factors represent similar things in stocks. So the last 10 years, momentum has been effectively the carbohydrate of the markets. It's been really, really good fuel on the way up, but it can just as quickly lead to a sugar crash when some exogenous event comes. And like Newton said, an object in motion tends to remain in motion until there's some external force. Now, a lot of people think that they can predict that external force. We don't believe that. And so we're cautious about momentum and how we're positioned around it, but we don't try to predict it. However, what you saw was an external force. By virtue of the bond market, there was a, a small change in the yield curve that effectively was the, the straw that broke the camel's back. So long story short, momentum is a factor. It's a nutrient that goes into many different stocks. Some investors try to build a portfolio around those factors or those nutrients specifically. But us, we don't build portfolios based on quantitative variables. We look at the fundamental factors that underlie the companies that those stocks. But it's good. You continue to go into how how the investment's been picked why you own it, why you're not running for the exit. I got to think you get a lot of positive feedback about that. We do. And I'm most excited about the feedback loop, right? The quick feedback loop that we can deliver folks. You know, it's scary to wake up one day and to see, you know, stock down 5, 10, 15, 20% on virtually no news. I've been there personally. I know that feeling. And we're very much, you know, the fight or flight instinct tends to kick in. And so what's great about about the platform that we built is whether you like video, Joe, or whether you re- you personally like to listen to audio notes on, on the subway on the way to work, or whether you prefer to just read emails or, or digest in the app. We deliver exactly what you just played in a bunch of different forms. And so we're just excited to, that we can help folks understand what they own better and hopefully make much better financial decisions. Let's talk about, though, how you guys actually pick investments. You talk about the highest conviction that uh, hedge fund managers own, those type of positions. How do you get access to that? What's the mechanism by which you can track some of these hedge fund managers? That's a great question because many folks don't know that hedge funds actually have to report what they own every quarter. The SEC requires hedge funds to report what's called a 13F form. So the SEC, you know, they have this online database and you can pull the 13F form up for any big hedge fund that has over $100 million, I think it is. So you can go look at some of the largest funds in the world, and you can say every quarter, you can actually see their top 10, 20, 30 stocks. Now, for a lot of funds, that's it's very much noise. You know, For funds that are trading in and out of stocks, maybe they're running a quantitative strategy like we talked about with Momentum, those 13F forms get stale very quickly. So if you, you pull out that form a week after it's published to the database, well, that fund can be completely out of all those stocks. So it's pretty it's pretty bad idea to follow a fund like that. However, if you follow funds that primarily have a long-term oriented strategy where they don't change their stocks, they don't change the, the jockeys they're betting on very often, well, then the 13F form can actually be a really good representation for what they own. And that's what we do here at Titan. So we look at the 13F forms of long-term focused funds. And as a result, we can build a basket of what we like to call their all-star team, right? It's the top 20 stocks that if you got some of the smartest hedge fund managers in a room and you asked them all to name their 10 best ideas and you wrote those all down on the list and you looked at the Venn diagram between them all, you'd end up with something resembling Titan. Yeah. And what's funny is, you know, we just talked about uh, Warren Buffett. Let's let's kind of close that loop. You guys over the history of Titan, and I know it's not yet a super long term, you're not seeing that at all. You're seeing that when you stick with this uh, strategy, so far, so good. I would agree. I think the the key difference, I think if Buffett were in the room, I think where where we would all agree is that in investing, there are really no sustainable get rich quick schemes, right? No one ever made a billion dollars on a, you know, pitching a get rich slowly scheme, right? And Buffett makes this joke, but I think it's very true about investing. And it's actually very, very much, in my opinion, a reason why hedge funds have underperformed. There's a lot of folks that they're incentivized to try to swing for the fences every year because they're paid these big cash bonuses, right? And so, you know, if they lose money, well, they'll make it back next year. Their clients just eat the losses. And if they make a billion dollars, they get 20% of that. That's a really, really good compensation scheme for for many funds. 
But the problem is that it misaligns their interests with their investors. And that's what Buffett was really getting at, in my view. And that's what we aim to solve here at Titan. So we're aligned with our investors. You know, we charge one simple fee, 1% of assets. We don't charge a performance fee. We have no lockups. So we really make it so that, honestly, we have to make sure our, our interests are aligned with clients because they could leave us very easily. And I think our clients appreciate that. Yeah, no, I, I think they appreciate that. I think they appreciate the education I love, I have a few other things that I could play. You guys talked about the iPhone. When Netflix comes out with, like, you immediately have uh, good information for people. So people get not just a basket of stocks that a lot of professionals love, but also they start to understand why they hold it. Exactly. It, I think with Titan, it's as important to understand why you own a stock as it is the stock you, you've picked, the stock you've owned. And the reason is the market goes up, the market goes down. Stocks have bad days. Stocks have great days. If you're just reacting to the way a stock is moving on a price graph, you're, you're trading, you're speculating, you're not based, investing based on fundamentals. That's how, unfortunately, a lot of people invest. And it's because they've never been taught the ropes. So what we aim to do here with the videos you talked about and, and the in-app digest, it's all about making people smarter investors. And as a result, not only do they understand more about the companies they own, but they actually improve the probability that they make money in our strategy, right? Like that, I think many of your listeners probably own mutual funds and ETFs. And I think even if you own a diversified basket of stocks, that does not guarantee you investment success. I think that's one of the, the common myths. If you're trading in and out of a basket of 100 stocks, you, you're likely going to underperform just a, a monkey that kind of sits and holds, you know, that goes away on vacation for 10 years, they come back. And so I think the behavioral component of investing is incredibly important. And, and that's why we built this to, as an app, you know, as opposed to a, a publicly traded security, if you will. That's the next time you're on, we will just spend 15, 20 minutes, uh, Clayton, talking behavior. Because that's, that's a whole different thing, man. But, it's, <laughs> but, but it is. It's a big part of why you win or lose. I totally agree with you. So for Stacky Benjamin's listeners, guys, stackers, head to titanvest.com forward slash Benjamin's. And you can check on more about Titan and all the resources there. Uh, go through all the links. Clayton, thanks a ton for hanging out with us and talking Titan. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Enjoy talking with you. Hey there, new and seasoned investors. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And wasn't that a great discussion about investing for beginners today? You know, I love getting back to the basics every once in a while. An expert like me, you know, we got to get grounded. Sure, dining out at the Sizzler every night in the basement's dollar would be fun, but what's wrong with grabbing a 12-pack from Taco Bell like I did back in the day? You know, aside from the heartburn, I remember back in my college days at Southwest Bahama Technical Institute and Beauty School, old Doug could down at least 20 of those bad boys. No sweat. And uh, while that was good fun and all, the poor saps in college these days don't have as much disposable taco money anymore. Don't believe me? Check it out. For kicks, we'll call it today's trivia question. Among the graduating class of 2018, a whopping 69% of college students, nice, took out student loans. What was their average debt when they graduated? I'll be back with your answer right after this. Didn't see that coming with the Taco Bell beginning. I have to say, I didn't think, I'll leave it to Doug to transfer from Taco Bell to college debt. But... That's the question, kids. And for those of you who are new to this, we have a year-long competition going on. I always get the score wrong, and I've had a score revision given to me from our friend Steve. Thank you to our engineer, Steve Stewart, the amazing Steve Stewart. It turns out, Paula, you're winning this competition. Woohoo! I know. Who, who knew? You? I who didn't know. <laughs> I had no idea. When you took the lead, I... Didn't I know didn't know. But according to uh, Steve, who's got the real score, why I haven't kept good score, I have I have no clue. But Paula's got 12. Len has 11. OG has nine. Ryan, you're playing on behalf of Len today. You understand the convoluted Price is Right style rules of this year game? Yes, sir. All right. Here we go. OG, you have nine. So you get to decide. Last. You want to... There you go. He wants to go last. And then playing on behalf of Len, who's in second, would you like to go in the middle or first, Mr. Inman? Uh, the middle. That is weird. 
which means Paula, shockingly, you're going Shocking. first. What is the average amount of student loan debt? We're looking for a dollar number. The average person in the class of 2018 came out with. I'm guessing first I will just make this guess with no commentary. Oh, no. <laughs> What's up with that? Oh, I, I will save my commentary for, for later. My guess is $34,000. $34,000. Ryan? I think she's getting a piece of the cut because she's trying to keep the show shorter. Yeah, you know, watch these two. So knowing that uh, what I know about student debt, I really hope I don't blow this one, but I think it's $36,000. 36000 bucks. Oh, gee. Average student loan debt. Does this include the people that don't have student loans? Nope. It's the average amount the people that do have student loans took out. $1. I'm going to take the under. I wish I don't that know. was the case. I don't know. But you think it's less than 34000 is what you're saying. I don't know. I don't know the answer to this. It's close. Paula, were you trying to widen the gap there? I've looked up this stat before. To the best of my recollection, it's somewhere within the 30000 range. And so by guessing thirty four, I was trying to put myself in a position in which the next people who guessed after me would give me enough of a spread that given that I was the first guesser, I would be able to have some type of spread. This is far too complicated. <laughs> <laughs> that's where that's where I thought you were headed. I'm like, oh, that's that's very very interesting. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I, I might have just guessed thirty, but by virtue of the fact that I was the first, I knew that I had to position myself in such a way that it would force the hand of the next person to have to go either higher or you know decently higher or lower, which therefore would give me a spread. Yeah. yeah, I thought it was in like a high 30s, but I might be also looking at our average client's got 298,000. So I might be off quite a bit. Well, we will see With that 298 moving that average up. So <laughs> yeah. we're, we're going to we're going to find out here in just a second. The following is an actor, not a real person. We tried to find an actual Stacking Benjamins podcast listener, but we're not sure any exist. Yesterday, I turned on one of those other podcasts. Ugh, more money talk? The topic was something called long-term care, and they couldn't even make me care for the short term. That podcast made me feel like just another number. Hi, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, the huge star of the award-winning Stacking Benjamin Show. Are you tired of podcasts that blabber on about money? Are you confused about all this IRA, SEPP, 72T, and fiduciary talk? At Stacking Benjamins, you're not just another number to us. Heck, if you actually listen, you're the only number. That's why we barely ever talk about money. Better yet, we treat you like family. We'll invite you on down to Joe's mom's basement, serve you some pie and maybe even a little lemonade. And best yet, when you leave, we'll complain about you behind your back. Because that's what real family moments are all about. I'm never going back to that old podcast. Stacking Benjamins is a way for me to avoid numbers and feel that warm, fuzzy feeling I get every time I scream at my sister on the phone. Stacking Benjamins, where you're not a number. Your family. Thirty four thousand, Paula, feeling at all confident? Yeah, I mean my my window is between thirty four to thirty six. So yeah. if the number's anywhere in there, then I'm the winner. Yeah, Ryan gave you a lot of room, Ryan. The over thirty six thousand. You work with physicians. Those people are six figures. Yeah. Like, a, yeah, our average client's 298000 so. yeah, It's a bunch of student debt. And OG, we you got a lot of wiggle room to the top. Then. That's right. You've got everything below 34. Feeling confident? Not really. <laughs> yeah. nah. Well, let's, uh, Doug, what's our answer? Welcome back, taco and trivia lovers alike. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and let's get your trivia answer so I can head on out and maybe replicate the old days with a taco or 12, if you know what I mean. Here was a question. What was the average college loan debt for the graduating class of 2018? The answer, 
According to Student Loan Hero, if you said they graduated with an average debt of $29,800, which includes both private and federal debt, you'd be correct. That's a lot of hot sauce to figure out how to pay for later. See ya! Oh, come on. Pa- Paula was exactly right, but wrong. <laughs> I, I remember it being in like a 30,000. I would have guessed 30,000. Even if I had guessed 30, it would have been wrong. Yes. Man. Which would have been better, actually. Which is why. Oh, yeah, that would have been funnier. Would have been better radio. Which is why our friends at Jacob Media at Podcast Movement did the focus group. Listener Danny, I believe his name's Danny, uh, who's a big Gator fan. Danny said he doesn't like Price is Right style because Paula would have won. And even if she was, even if she was. I wouldn't have guessed a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> you guess at least $5. Yeah. Right. So, OG, coming back now, 12, 11, 10. The, the, it tightens as we get closer to the end of the year. Just a couple weeks left. So have you announced what the big prize is for the winner? Uh, you uh, get to come back next year. <laughs> That's what we're discussing right now. Yes. yes. Paul's like, if that's the prize, pass. <laughs> right. Hey, let's take out the magnifying glass and have somebody do better with their money. Today's hotline call comes to us courtesy of Magnify Money, because when you head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money, you know what you find about those financial products you use every day, Ryan? I'm about to find out, aren't I? You find out they're nowhere near the best in class, my friend. With all the products available at Magnify Money, whether it's uh, checking accounts, savings accounts, those credit cards in your wallet, consolidation loans for your student debt, whatever it might be, head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money for more. Today, we're throwing out the Magnify Money call to who's calling in? Our friend Tyler. Say hi, Tyler. Hey, Joan OG. My name's Tyler here. Love the show. Just got done actually listening to the one that talks about how to get out of college debt free. And I'm actually going to be able to do that this December. And I have an awesome job locked up right when I graduate. But my question is, you know, what to do now to kind of capitalize on this opportunity that I have? I know it's important to take advantage of like your employer's 401k, maybe even set up a Roth IRA outside of your employer. But I almost feel like that's not enough. I feel like there should be other things that I should be focusing on or taking advantage of. So I thought I'd give you guys a, you know, a call and get your insight. So thanks. Looking forward to hear from you. Bye. Thanks for the question, Tyler. I love this question today because we're talking to new investors. Tyler's got a lot of cool stuff he's doing, Ryan, but uh, looking for the the next uh, cool thing. I think you're going to tell him he should get, what was the phrase, cute and fancy? Sure. <laughs> get cute and fancy, Tyler. Yeah. What should Ty, What do you think Tyler should really do next? Uh, I, th- I think it's awesome work that you've gone through school and you're coming out debt free. That's a really, really big accomplishment and one that you shouldn't brush off or take lightly. Um, I, I think that's amazing work. So great job there. Uh, you know, obviously max out your 401k or your 403b if you're going to have that, your IRAs, your HSA, if, if you're, if that's available. And then the taxable account would be the next step. But before I'd go there, uh, I'd, I'd really sit down and write out some goals and understand what are your short-term and your long-term goals. And if you're going to save for the short term, let's say it's buy a house in the next few years, that money can go in a high yield savings account. You know, if it's long term goal, then that can be in a taxable account. But uh, really, I think the next piece is is that behavioral side is to really look at it and go, what are you getting up and getting out of bed, going to work for? And what really motivates you? What makes you happy? And how can you have your money work for you and support that life? Um, while, well, you know, paying yourself first and doing the right stuff like 401k and the IRA and all the other good stuff that you should be prioritizing. Paula, you don't think that uh, Ryan's right, do you? Don't you think you should open up a Robinhood account and buy some Tesla stock? Heck yeah! <laughs> I know it worked because it worked for me and a single anecdotal case study is universally applicable for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, what I think you should do if, uh, you know, I, I don't know uh, how much money he's going to be able to contribute to his 401k or his IRA. But assuming he can make solid contributions to them both, I would also be looking at whether or not he is eligible to be in an HSA eligible health insurance plan. Because assuming that he is 
uh, we know he's young, but assuming that he's healthy, which he may or may not be, I don't want to make the assumption that all young people are healthy, but assuming that he is, assuming that he's not expecting to have any major medical expenses or, you know, huge ongoing prescription costs or anything like that, it could be to his benefit to be in a high deductible HSA eligible plan so that then he can also contribute to an HSA. So that's the next thing I'd be looking at. And by the way, Tyler, to piggyback on what Paul is talking about, on Monday, if you missed it, we had Scott Heiser on. And part of what we talked about is who an HSA is best for. And he said uh, that, I mean, just to give you the the short of it, it's people who are super healthy and sometimes people who are super, super sick. And he talks about the math you have to do yourself ahead of time. But it's it's actually fairly easy math, but he explains it in a great way back on Monday's show. That's Scott Heiser for people that that missed it. Oh, gee, this is where I hate going last because I don't know how you add to either one of those. I was going to say I don't. So based on the (laughs) under bet that I have with my bookie. (laughs) There it is. I I can't compete with these two. Yes. Thanks for the call, Tyler. If you've got a question for the team, head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash voicemail. Once you get there, there's just a record button. And as long as there's a microphone on your device, just leave a message. Easy peasy lemon squeezy for the show. That's going to do it for today. Uh, OG, big plans this weekend? I always have big plans. Make snow angels and... Uh, Perfect. You know. In Texas. Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. that's right. I'm in the basement today. Yes, you um, are. It is kind of Christmas cookie time. And if I don't know what episode it is, but get yourself some Biscoff. Make Biscoff peanut butter blossoms, but without peanut butter. I am starving. And Not a good time to I've talk had, about I've that. had many people call me and say, I heard that. I can't believe how awesome that is. Oh. So go get yourself some Biscoff spread for all your peanut butter allergy people. It's amazing. Mm. Speaking of amazing, how about that amazing Afford Anything podcast? What's coming up next there, Paula Pant? On the amazing Afford Anything podcast, we've got some guy by the name of Joe Saul Sihai. Shut up. Who we totally do. We got an exclusive with him. <laughs> so he comes on the show to answer questions from our listeners about what they should do with their lives. And on on our show, he's actually quite serious and thoughtful <laughs> and intelligent. <laughs> Which is funny because we warn people listen to your show mm-hmm. that we get a little different side of Paula over here. And we warn people here that they get a little different side of Paula. <laughs> oh, yeah, di- of you. A different side of me yeah, exactly. over there. Yes. But I will say this and not to foreshadow anything, but I had that little fee rant today. I may or may not rant to afford anything, listeners, on your show. Oh, yeah. I just uh, re-listened to that right before we started this shortwave taping. He's coming and, in uh, hot, huh? It's good. It's it, good. So, uh, so tune in to the Afford Anything podcast. You can find it on any podcast playing app, which is an abbreviation for application. <laughs> and that is a thing that you can find on your smartphone. <laughs> <laughs> Say it ain't so. Really? It is so. <laughs> Mr. Inman, I'm so happy you graced us with your presence. You not only have a podcast, you, sir, I don't know if you know this, you got a book coming out. I do know this because I wrote it. Oh. <laughs> Tell me about it. Times, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. So, yeah, I host the Financial Residency Podcast. So while you're on that application on your smartphone looking for Afford Anything, if you feel really board, you can also go to financial residency and check it out. But uh, we, have the, we have the books coming out you know, January 15th and really excited. It's going to be called Financial Residency. It's kind of self-titled, but uh, it'll allow people to actually create their own financial plan. Um, you know, if you actually read it cover to cover and I've got a free course that goes along with it, that'll allow you to kind of download templates and things that I use with clients. Uh, so if you actually want to put together a plan and get it done and Actually start the new year off right. Check it out. Oh, that's crazy talk. Who would want that? I know. It's nuts, <laughs> but it's all there. How do people get it, Ryan, if people want to pre-order it now while they're listening? Yeah. So you can go to financialresidency.com slash book and you can check it out and pre-order it there. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us again. It's been too long. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's always fun to hang out with you guys. Doug, you've got it from here, man. Uh, OG's like speed it up because I want the over and under uh, below 56 minutes. By the way, I don't want to talk too much about this, but I will tell people this that usually end the show here. Look at the end of the show and then go to that 
application that's on your smartphone or your device and look at the amount of time left in the show. That's all I'm going to say. Take it from here, Doug. Wow. What should we have learned today? Well, Joe, I'll tell you what they should have learned today. First, take some advice from Ryan, Paula, and even OG. By focusing on the basics when you're starting out, you're sure to steadily grow your net worth and your financial acumen. Second, how about learning from Clayton Gardner? When you're investing, try to learn a little bit about your investments every day. It's like riding a bike, and the more you know, the faster you'll pedal. But the big lesson? Don't tell Joe's mom that you're headed for tacos to celebrate the old days. She'll tell you that the best way to celebrate times long gone is by taking out the garbage. She says you'll remember lots of trashy stuff. Trashy stuff. Don't egg her on. That joke was pretty disposable. I would never laugh at a throwaway like that. Jeez. Special thanks to Ryan Inman for appearing on our roundtable. You can find more from Ryan at physicianwealthservices.com or through our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Paula Pint appears courtesy of affordanything.com and Afford Anything podcast. All the Afford Anythings. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at, at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and it appears I've fallen and I can't get up. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. Normally we talk about all kinds of things, but we needed to catch up for those of you that have been listening uh, throughout the summer. Well, even for those of you who have been listening throughout the summer, because you won't know what the hell we're talking about. If not, <laughs> we've been following this guy all the way across uh, partway across America. And then he and I could not catch up together. We were in different spots at different times, starting around, I'm going to say late July, early August. And I had a bunch of people ask in our Facebook group, where the heck is Joe? And every once in a while, he'd pop in and tell those people. But uh, Joe Jimenez joins me in the basement. And uh, dude, how are you? I'm doing fine, Joe. Thanks for uh, reaching back out to me. How are you? Well, good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you were able to stop by because, you know, we, when we last left you, you were in a small town in Colorado. You had just, uh, I think you'd done some work for, there was something, there was some phrase you used like carpet bagging or something, <laughs> something or other. Uh, yeah, I, I did a work for stay. We, we were dirt bagging. Dirt bagging. Uh, that's the phrase. Yeah. <laughs> We did a little bit of work for a hotel so we could stay there for free because uh, we had some bad weather coming in. So we just did a little bit of work and got to uh, have a free room. So, I mean, when you don't have an income and you're just uh, spending money but not making any money, uh, any little bit helps. Well, let's talk about actually, for, let's catch everybody up that didn't follow us early, uh, late spring into summer, was that you started off – at the border of Mexico and New Mexico, right? And, Correct. And you were doing the Continental Divide Trail. Yes, sir. And initially, all the way through New Mexico, it looked like life was awesome. You're making great time. The scenery was beautiful. If I remember right, it was starting to get a little hot, but then you transitioned into Colorado. Would that be accurate? 
That's accurate. And then you hit Colorado and you, <laughs> and you got into higher, higher elevations. And all of a sudden I start seeing these pictures of you on Instagram with snow. Oh yeah. There was a lot of snow. You can ask any, uh, anybody from Colorado this year, the last winter was, um, an extremely unconventional snow year. It's, uh, it was a lot of snow and, uh, it was hard. <laughs> It was uh, so hard that I uh, just decided to call it quits on the Continental Divide Trail, and uh, I just uh, came up with Plan B. Yeah. So, how far into Colorado were you when the snow was too deep and you just couldn't do it anymore? Not very much, actually. About a week and a half in. Did you get on a bus? Get on a plane? What happened? I hitchhiked to Durango, Colorado, got a one-way rental, and drove all the way over to San Diego, California, <laughs> and started started again. <laughs> Started over because, you know, hiking 900 miles this summer wasn't enough for me. <laughs> so you switched the Pacific. Have you ever done the Pacific Coast Trail before? I had not. Uh, but as, as you may know, it's part of the big three long trails in the U.S. that make up the Triple Crown. I already have hiked the AT and part of me just thought that I may want to hike all three and achieve the Triple Crown, which is less than 500 people have done before. So I said, well, you know, I mean, if I can't do the Continental Divide this year... Maybe I'll just start on the Pacific Crest Trail and I'll see how far I get. And uh, that's that's that was my mindset. And uh, here I am and I finished the PCT. So uh, I guess I, I don't know, maybe did the right thing. I have had the pleasure of meeting your spouse, Katie, who clearly, by the way, dude, is your better half. She's way cooler than you. <laughs> What, what does she think when you called her and told her that you're, you know, not just aborting this trail, that you're going to go start, start up a different one? <laughs> Oh man. She just says I'm crazy. No, I mean, I guess she was, she was happy for my safety. Uh, in reality, the conditions in the, on the Colorado in Colorado were pretty unsafe. There was a high avalanche risk. And, uh, you know, when I told her I was starting the starting back in Mexico, she was still like, you know, had to process it for a little while. But as soon as uh, she realized there wasn't as much snow, she, I think she was on board with the idea. But now you're south of San Diego and into San Diego, and now it's the middle of summer. So I would assume until you got to that San Diego and that climate that it, it must have been hot as hell. <laughs> Starting on the border of Mexico and California, May 19th, it's exactly as hot as you'd imagine. Oh. <laughs> how many? I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm crazy. Yeah. How many miles would you do a day on average? Well, on the PCT, since I already had my legs, since I had already hiked for about a little over a month, I was doing around 30 miles a day. And uh, at some days I did 40 miles a day. I, I just uh, started hiking at sunrise and walked until sunset. So yeah, r roughly 30, 35 miles a day was a was an average day for me. Would you have a place in mind ahead of time where you were going to camp? Not really. It's just one of those things, you know, it's just kind of, I'm, I'm more, I'm usually a planner. So being on the trail was, it, it's kind of good for me because you, it's hard to plan. You don't know where you're going to camp. You just kind of go with the flow. And as long as you uh, have water for the night, you know, for the, for camp so you can have dinner, um, that's, you just pretty much find a flat place to camp. And so I, I wouldn't usually know. And sometimes I'd be a little scary. Sometimes I'd find myself walking a lot longer than I wanted to until I could finally find a place to camp. But uh, no, I just kind of just kind of went with it. And that's what you'll find most of the hikers when they're doing a through hike. It's kind of what they do. They just kind of just see where they end up, I guess. This is a dream of a lot of people. They either want to hike the Appalachian Trail, the PCT, the Continental Divide, or even, uh, you know, the way uh, going through Europe into Spain. And uh, and if you want to extend it into Portugal, right, to go to the sea. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the Camino. Yeah. A lot of people want to do something like you've done. Describe to me the people that you meet on these hikes. Interesting people, fun people, or everybody pretty much keep to themselves. Oh my gosh. It's the most interesting people I've ever met. You know, a lot of these people, a lot of people, I guess, have a misconception that a lot of the hikers are just hiker trash is a, f a term that's been, you know, thrown around. <laughs> hiker trash are people that are uncivilized or uneducated. And, and the reality is a lot of the people are, I've met doctors, I've met married couples, teachers that are, you know, just have professional lives back at home that are well-educated and um, are well-traveled. Their worldview is, uh, is pretty great. And you, I just learned a lot from a lot of the people I meet. So 
Yeah, the hikers are, they, I mean, they come in all shapes and sizes. Um, it's not just a one, one size fits all hiker, but uh, I've met people in their 70s. I've met 19 year olds. So it's a wide range. I love that about the trail is, I mean, at the end of the day, if you can walk if you can uh, slap on a backpack and walk long distances, I mean, you know, it's pretty easy to do. Um, you just have to prioritize it. So, I mean, the people that have carved a little bit of time in their lives to do something like a through hike, as you'd imagine, they're pretty interesting people, you know. So, yeah, I meet a lot of foreigners. This trail, I hiked a good portion of the trail with a guy from the Czech Republic, and I learned a lot from him. So, I mean, I can go on and about the people. You, you just meet all kinds of interesting characters. Well, and to your point too, when you talk about education levels and, and, uh, people that have all kinds of professional things they do, you yourself are an engineer, right? Yes, sir. After college, I didn't have a job because I graduated in 2011. So there wasn't many, you know, it was kind of hard, difficult to get a job in engineering. So I just took that as an opportunity to hike the AT. And then after that, I kind of just saw what was, you know, what kind of, what was out there in the world. Um, what, I could accomplish, uh, with a little bit of money saved up and everything. So after the AT, I did find an engineering job and I saved like crazy to try to do another trail and do another long trip like this. And, and for the next seven years, I just saved up everything, you know, everything I could got really involved with the fire, with the fire lifestyle, financially independent, retire early. So that's how I personally was able to, you know, carve some time and money to do the hike. Do you try to avoid towns or do you go into towns to get some good food and like to use TripAdvisor and find some good places to eat or is there a different guide that you use? Usually I just stick my thumb out and uh, try to reach any town I can and get a hitchhike into town. And I'll just ask, I'll ask the locals, man. I just get into town and I just follow my nose as a hiker. I mean, at the end of the day, just any food that you can just (laughs) <laughs> scarf down is, is is amazing. So usually it involved a lot of pizza, uh, a lot of going to the bar and maybe having a couple of beers. But uh, yeah, just as much uh, as much food as we can possibly stuff into our mouth. So no, I mean yeah, I love towns. I because we visited towns about once once every week or so. So by the time you made it to the next town, I mean it was you were long overdue. <laughs> it was like heaven. Oh yeah, I mean can you imagine just like not having warm food and I didn't even carry a stove. So I didn't have, I didn't even have warm food. So, I mean, to be honest, didn't even matter. I just love the mom and pop cafes just where, you know, the, the lady calls you honey and, you know, and, uh, just, you can get a mediocre cup of coffee. That was, that was great for, uh, for a hiker on the trail. Tell me about the scenery changes as, as you went up the trail. All right. Well, since you start out on the border of, uh, Mexico and California, it is pretty dry. However, this year was a very, call it a wet year. There was a lot of rain, so it uh, was surprisingly more lush than you'd think. And you follow the Pacific Crest Mountains, really. So it is pretty hilly, uh, rolling hills. But really quickly, when you get to the High Sierra, I'm not sure if you've been there, Joe, but you uh, it's where like Yosemite National Park is. Yeah. You just quickly realize just the change. You know, the mountains are more jagged. You're higher. You're in a higher elevation. Uh, there's definitely this year, even there, there was just a lot more snow, um, not the, as much as on the continental divide in Colorado, yeah. but there was definitely a lot of snow in the high Sierra. Is the John Muir trail part of the Pacific coast trail? Yes. Uh, for a couple hundred miles, it actually parallels. It's the same trail. Yeah. So that was the funny thing is that, you know, we were hiking on the Pacific crest trail and all of a sudden we'd see a lot of the people hiking the JMT or the John Muir trail. They are, they hike it. The, in the other direction. So we'd see these uh, bright eyed, bushy tail John Muir <laughs> hikers, you know, but, you know, and you got to imagine at this point we've hiked, you know, well over a thousand miles. So, you know, we're seeing these JMT hikers and you, you just feel like, you know, Mr. Tough guy and, you know, just <laughs> you're pumping out your chest saying, Hey, Hey, they're JMT hikers, you know, and they're <laughs> just completely fresh, no beards at all. They still smell really nice. So it's the same trail, but, uh, and that's a good one. I, I would recommend starting with if you, maybe can't carve out, you know, six months of your life to do the Pacific Crest Trail or the Continental Divide Trail. The John Muir Trail is a good one to start with at a couple hundred miles. You talking about that puffing out your chest reminds me of my my friends who run ultra marathons. One of them has a t-shirt that says, oh, you ran a marathon? How cute. (laughs) 
same stuff. So exactly. Yeah. So you go through Yosemite. So that's a beautiful part of the trail, I'll bet. And then north of Yosemite, what happens? North of Yosemite, you, you get into what uh, it, it's a it's a concept called the uh, NorCal Blues, actually. The desert's really cool. You're still in the honeymoon phase, right? You just started hiking. Everything's great, right? You're just getting getting used to it. You're really getting into the hiker life. And then you get into the Sierra, which is the most beautiful part of the whole trail, in my opinion. And then after you finish that, it's, I mean, it's a big challenge that you complete. So you get to Northern California. And then the trail, honestly, it just, you know, at the end of the day, you're hiking from Mexico to Canada. So not every single inch of the trail is going to be super interesting. Yeah. So it, it's kind of a, more of a, what a lot of people call boring part. I mean, there's, it, it's a challenging part, but there's nothing too dramatic in views or anything like that. So it just gets, you get back down in elevation and then you get into just kind of a more monotonous part of Northern California. And then, uh, and then you reach Oregon, which is where everybody does all their challenges. Cause it's, a uh, what we call it's, it's kind of flat. So you can, that's where you can really crank out big miles. People just attempt 50 plus mile days oh. in, in Oregon. So Oregon's beautiful. You go through Crater Lake National Park. Oh, that's fantastic. Is, it's, oh, it's so beautiful. Some of the darkest guys I've ever seen. I've seen so many shooting stars in Oregon. And I did my biggest day in Oregon as well. I, I hiked 57 miles in, in a, like within a 24 hour period. So I was pretty proud of that. And then you get to Washington State, which if you're late in the season, which I was uh, because I started late, you deal with a lot of rain and a lot of cold. So, you know, if I didn't have enough snow this summer, uh, I just I got some more in Washington and it was just a, almost every single day it either rained or snowed. So at, by that point, you know, I was determined to finish the trail. So nothing was stopping me at that point. But Washington was extremely beautiful. It was very thick, uh, thick forest. Not a lot of you don't cross a lot of roads. So it's just really it's more remote. And I really enjoyed Washington. Um, and actually, we were in there, in uh, kind of into the fall season. Do you go so, near? Do you go near Rainier or any anything like that or Baker? Oh yeah, or, yeah. Oh yeah, you go near. You go. Uh, yep, you go. I got a great picture. You go right. I mean, right behind it. You know, I got a bunch of great pictures of Rainier. It's a beautiful. I mean, I'm sure you. I don't know. I think you've been there, right? Went I have there been there. Yeah, summer? visiting my son. We went there. Yeah, oh, it's a, that's a beautiful area. Oh yeah, Rainier. Um, trying to think a uh, Snoqualmie pass was also, mm. you know, that area around there was really beautiful. Stevens pass. I don't know if you oh. were in that area. No, no, but I, but I've seen pictures and looks gorgeous. Oh yeah. I mean, Washington's a beautiful state. So, um, I just, I mean, I just had a blast out there. One question I have following you on Instagram was that it appeared the last couple few weeks, you were talking about how you were hurrying were you, you were hurrying to beat the weather coming in? You were hurrying because of a rainy season coming? Why were you really hurrying at the end? Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, towards the end, I mean, there's a window when you can hike the trail. And I was, I had to get off for a family emergency. So I was off the trail for about a month and a half ish. And I came back. And then, you know, before I was battling just, you know, being able to finish the trail. But at that point, then the, you know, the bad weather starts coming in and then a lot of the roads to access the trail get closed and everything. Oh, so it's more, so yeah, it's more of a safety issue. So I was just, just trying to stay ahead of that and make sure, you know, the trail wouldn't get closed or it just would be, you know, it was mostly just to, yeah, just to stay safe and not do anything too dangerous. So I was kind of, I mean, you could say rushing, it was about the last week and a half. I was really just putting in big days. And at that point it's just, I mean, can you imagine hiking 3,300 miles and then falling short 200 miles? Right. <laughs> At that point, I'm, you know, you're just, I'm just in the machine mode, just like get it done, you know? And, but I mean, yeah. it was still a lot of fun, uh, regardless of the big miles, just cause it's just, it being that beautiful, you can't not have fun out there in my opinion, you, but it was, it was a, a risk of not being able to finish and just being snowed out. And a lot of people, they did have that issue. They, what they had to do was they were forced to skip some sections and just, you know, just to kind of finish up in Canada. And then they, a lot of them plan to just come back next year and just oh. finish the sections they weren't able to do. Yeah. So, and you definitely wanted to try not to have to do that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. something about finishing the trail sure. in a single season is, is kind of, Oh, I get I, it. Yeah. In my opinion, it's a pretty big uh, accomplishment and I'm really proud of that. So I was making sure I, 
just, you know, completed a through hike in one season. Well, and definitely not comparing because I'm in the how cute phase with my marathon running, but <laughs> I've had marathons before where, you know, you just, your legs don't have it that day. And from mile 22 to mile 26, you're walking because you're like, I'm getting through this thing. And on a much, much more epic, far more epic level, I'm sure that I would feel, ex- I, I, I know how you feel, but on a much, much lower level, I'm not going to compare it at all. But I want to ask you about the town at the end of the trail. What's, is it called Longmont? Which one? Uh, the, uh, the town at the end of the trail. You took a bunch of pictures, a picture of yourself on top of a, uh, of a sign uh, showing the end of the trail. What's the, what, what's the town at the north end called? Oh, well, you mean on the Pacific Crest Trail? Yeah. Well, I finished in a town. It's called Manning Park. Manning Park. So, Man, I missed yeah. that one. Well, a lot of people backtrack, but I just decided to continue into Canada. So I had to continue after finishing the trail. I had to hike another eight miles, eight and a half miles because the trail just ends in the middle of the forest. (laughs) And I just finished, you know, I I had to, once you're done, you know, you take all your photos by the monument. And then I had to continue hiking almost another, almost nine miles into Canada. and, And that was Manning Park. So there's a state park there. It's a Canadian state park, but it was a, yeah, it was called Manning State Park. Did I see that they were like you timed it where they were having a they, they were having a parade or something as you went through? Oh, I know which ones you're talking. Okay, you're talking about Levensworth. Levensworth. Yes. yes, that's a really cool town. It's a little it's it's one of the last towns in Washington and it's kind of like one of those touristy German towns. It's like a I don't know if a, on the East Coast there's another one called uh, Helen Georgia. Uh-huh. And all the architecture is it's similar to that. It's the it's the Helen Georgia of the PCT. <laughs> And it's a really cool town. You can get a, you can get schnitzel and there's a bunch of uh, beer gardens and you can get a German pretzel. It was really cool. But there was a, there was a, I think it was some kind of, uh, I forget what the parade was for. I think, oh no, that's what it was. It was a autumn leaf festival. So I got to, uh, I, I got off the trail because the snow was so bad. And I got to uh, witness the uh, Autumn Leaf Festival in Levensworth. <laughs> so that was kind of cool. <laughs> That's so awesome. Yeah, I'm following I mean, the pictures. I'm like, this is bizarre. It's it, it seemed very fun. It's so cool when you do a you know you do a hike like this, and it's just another aspect of it that people don't even realize is you get to cross all these small little towns you never knew existed, you know, and you get to see how people live in these small towns, and you get to it's it's almost like a just a grand exploration. I didn't know anything about Levensworth. And then next thing you know, I'm staying there for three days and just watching a parade and meeting locals. And I mean, if you, if you're into that, uh, through hiking is, is a lot of fun. Yeah, that, no, that's, that's cool. So last question. So you come home, Katie's had the television remote the entire time you've been gone. How do you decide who's going to have the TV remote when you get back? (laughs) Oh man, she owns it now. I'm just, whatever she wants to watch. (laughs) Yep. Uh, and, and she had no interest in going or does she like shorter hikes? Uh, uh, tell me about that. Well, we do shorter hikes together for our honeymoon. We actually did a really cool trip. We, uh, a- after the AT, as you'd imagine, I'd want to continue to do all these crazy, epic, stupid, long hikes. And she's like, absolutely not. I'm not doing that. So we, uh, we take a lot of shorter trips together. So for our honeymoon, we actually road tripped from Florida to California and we did a bunch of small hikes in between. Uh, we hiked around Zion National Park, Grand Canyon. We'll do day trips, you know, oh, yeah. or overnighters, two night. I mean, that's, to be fair to her, she's smart. <laughs> she's not crazy like me. So the, the average person, that's uh, kind of what they enjoy doing. You kind of be kind of have to be a little crazy to do what I do. So together we will do shorter hikes. And But she says uh, she... She saves the long hikes for, for me, uh, solo hikes. <laughs> well, like I said before, she's way, you said she's smart. She's way smarter than you. Just uh, saying. Yep. I, I, w- I would agree. By far. Uh, you know what? Uh, uh, your Instagram is public, right? Yes, sir. Yes. Awesome. Cause I'm going to link to your Instagram and a lot of these pictures, if you don't mind. And, and so in the show notes, people that don't listen to the after show, will have no idea why I'm linking to you. <laughs> but, I'll get all these random strangers adding right. me like, yeah. you know, yes. Maybe. Yeah. So they can see that. And then you also have a blog called, uh, taking the alternate, taking the alternate.com. Yes, sir. Yep. And I'm actually, you know, I, I kind of had to, it was more difficult than I thought trying to keep up with it while I was on the trail. But, uh, now that I'm back, I'm focusing back on it and I'm going to be releasing some podcast episodes in the near future here. That is awesome. Joe, man, thanks for almost like with the continental divide trail, and then having to take a detour. Thanks for detouring back again. It's been since like July that we've talked, but thanks for finishing this up with me. 
No problem, Joe. It's a metaphor for life. You know, you never know what's going to happen and uh, you just got to take it one day at a time. And I'm just so grateful that you uh, were able to catch up with me and uh, be on the show again. And uh, I love your podcast. So it's uh, an honor to be on here with you.